I, I need to confirm that. Um, but I've just had a stark reminder of someone else who's just had um, a crypto, not, not even a hack, more of a faux pas. So, um, so there's a guy who's traveled all the way over here from Amsterdam, and he's lost his laptop. And all of his crypto is in that laptop. And the backup phrase for his MetaMask wallet was on a USB stick in the same bag. I, I, honestly, I, I've lost my crypto funds so many times, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, so it's just a stark reminder. Don't walk around with your seed phrase. Um, hide them. And remember the 3-2-1 principle. You need to write your, um, your crypto, crypto, crypto passwords in three different for, um, uh, instances. Store them in at least two different um, types of medium. So whether it's paper in a fireproof bag or etch them into titanium, whatever. And store them in more than two different locations. So not one location. Um, and this is coming from someone that sent once 15 Bitcoin to the wrong address in 2016. I've got hacked by going on a dodgy porn website once. Um, I, uh, I've got a, I've got a computer in my office with at least, oh, actually, no, with crypto prices tumbling, probably about 60K's worth of alts because I've lost the passwords. I've, been ha I've, just, I've lost crypto so often, so I, I know your pain, and it's gutting. Um, so I guess the, the, the two learning points from this, which I've learned from bitter experience, is one, the 3 two, one principle, which I just said, just have the backups. Please, please have the backups. And two, use it as a, a jump pad to get yourself into a, in a, a position in life where you know, a, a five grand crypto loss like that won't knock you for six. Now, if you go back 10 years ago, that would have knocked me for six when I had no money. Um, and now, now it wouldn't. And so you need to try and Maybe, if possible, use this, this crypto faux pas as inspiration to build your business or set up a brand new business so you have extra cash flow. Um, because that's all it did for me. One of my early mentors, which he obviously didn't know, but uh, is, I, I read all of his books and his audio books, a guy called Jim Rohn, probably the grandfather of um, personal development. I freaking love Jim Rohn. And one quote that always sticks in me whenever I screw up is, don't wish things were easier, wish you were better. And every time I mess up, I just have his, his weird voice, don't wish you were, things were easier, wish you were better. Um, so yeah, be better. <laughs> don't lose your shit. Um, apologies, but thankfully, we had a spare room at hand, so he's now got a, a hotel room for the night. Um, Right, let's crack on. We have lunch in exactly half an hour. So I'm going to squeeze this one hour presentation into 30 minutes, <laughs> which I think will be fine. Um, and I want to talk about uh, Bitcoin as a weapon system. So I came across, and some of you probably also came across, uh, oh, in fact, before we go any further, is Jonathan Orca in the room? Jonathan. Yeah. There you are, my man. This legend... Travel, where have you traveled from? Where, 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 where? California. California. He flew from California to be here today. Like, massive round of applause. <laughs> Honestly. This, thank you. It's, yeah. It, give me a hug. Much, much appreciated. So, other than California, because that is the winner, who else has traveled from a distance? Nah. <laughs> oh, hey, is that Simon? Hey, all I see is bright lights. I can barely see you. Who else has traveled from afar? Norwich. Norwich, Norwich yes. Istanbul. Istanbul. Um, <laughs> one last Cavoisio. Here we go. Congrats. <laughs> Istanbul. That is... That's amazing. What's your name, sir? Ross Howard. Oh, Ross. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. well done, mate. Thank you. Uh, much, much appreciated. So... Um, yeah, right. I love these cuddles. I see all sorts of people that I haven't seen. Like, um, at, I, I was in the Air Force um, with, a, with lots of people, obviously, but there's someone that I went through training with called Annabelle. Um, Annabelle Bacon. Oh, not Bacon. She's, you're no longer a Bacon. You're a Freeman now, aren't you? Where, where is Annabelle? Ah, there you are. Yeah, so 
So I haven't seen her since I've been in the Air Force, but I don't know, 13 years ago. And it's sort of, I actually thought of you um, with this, this first chart um, when I made it. And I was like, ah, because I, I didn't know that you were coming. And Annabelle can attest to this. When going through military training, even officers training, the first thing you do, it, like at Cranwell, we spent a fair bit of time learning about air power. You know how the Air Force is always going on about air power, air power, and, and you learn about war. And then as you go through pilot training, you, you do even more air power stuff, and you learn about war. And then I went to um, Shrivenham, so the Joint Staff Command College, and uh, as a holding officer. But again, I was amongst generals doing war games uh, at Shrivenham, um, Shrivenham. And it was, uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. And then I spent a bit of time um, in the intelligence community. And so I've got like a, a, a different perspective to war than, let's say, the average person on the street. And when I came across a guy called Jason Lowry, who's part of the US Space Force, um, he put Bitcoin into a frame of context, which I was already familiar with, which is air power projection. But he's, he's sort of converted normal air power sort of doctrine into energy projection. And it was one of those big slaps in the face for me. Uh, and I thought I had to, I, I had to talk about Bitcoin as a weapon system because it really is, now I think about it. And it also comes back into my, as I said yesterday in the trading pub, in my book, the crypto book, I actually put at the very end there that I have a sneaky suspicion that Bitcoin is a Trojan horse created by the NSA. Uh, and for those of you who think that's batshit crazy, it's not as batshit as it seems. In 1996, the NSA created a document. Um, it's a long title, like how to create cryptographic assets for the, uh, uh, digital currency for the future, or something like that. And also, the NSA also created SHA-256 bit encryption. Now, the Bitcoin white paper is pretty much a carbon copy of that NSA white paper. And Bitcoin's whole security is around 256 bit encryption, which the NSA made. And I've got a good hacker friend, and I spoke to him a few years ago saying, look, obviously SHA-256 is open source, we can all see the code, but whoever created it, is there still a way that you could fit a backdoor into SHA-256? And he said, even though it is outsourced and everything is visible, there could be a way that there could be a backdoor. So this sort of takes me to my little black tin hat, um, sort of inkling that Bitcoin could be a Trojan horse, maybe. Um, and but uh, that's for another time. That's for a beer, maybe. But let's, let's keep it more non-loony. As I say that, wearing a silly clown outfit with a shark with a laser on its head. Um, so, <laughs> so there are more things in this planet which are weapon systems than you can think of. The road systems created by the Roman Empire, that is a defensive weapons system. Why? Because it enabled the Romans to project power across most of, or, uh, uh, most of Europe and parts of the Middle East and, and uh, Northern Africa. It was a way to speed up logistics. It was a way to ferry back injured troops back to the mainland. It was a way to project power in, in the extremities of their empire where their enemies thought they would never get there on, on time. It was a way that they could flank their enemies. Um, the, I mean, Everything you look at these days really does stem back from the Roman Empire. The reason why our train tracks are a certain width is because of the way the roads are, Roman roads are created and, and wagons. Um, there, there's so many uh, things. But the road network, which we still actually have built on top of, um, is a weapon system which, when you think about it. When you think of GPS, what do you think? You think, oh, yeah, it helps you know, my Google Maps and ways to get me from A to B. Um, and the thing is, the physicists for a long time, back in sort of the 50s, were, command, were calling out for a constellation of satellites to help with precision timing, which is what they really needed for. Uh, they, they needed some cesium atomic clocks in space to have more precision timing for their experiments and whatnot, and also a way for a, a, a navigational constellation. But um, the, man, the people that controlled the first string said no, until a certain point. Does, so for non-RT members, what do you think created, what was the, the, the trigger thing, the flashpoint that created the, the official green light to build GPS for the non-RT members here? What do you think caused it? War, no, oh, oh, yeah, war, defense, sort of. I'm actually just stalling because I want this coffee. <laughs> 
surveillance, no, not, not quite. Almost finished the coffee. Trident missile system. Sorry? Yeah, sort of. They're not really spy satellites. There, there wasn't, so to begin with, there wasn't any optical uh, sensors on these, the, on these, uh, the earlier constellations. So <clears throat> there's a thing called INS, a national, a national, a national, a national navigation system. Too much coffee, straight to the system. Um, and we have it in planes. For, so for example, in a plane, you tend to land and you shut down and you tend to turn on the plane again roughly in the same spot, i.e. whatever airport you land at or airfield you land at, you're going to be turning on the engine, the aircraft on again. And so when you're configuring the INS on an aircraft, it still takes about five minutes. And what the INS does is go, right, I'm an aircraft. Where am I on planet Earth? Oh, I'm here. OK. And what, what it does is it measures movements, back, up, down, left, right, back, forward, etc. And it logs it. And it keeps track of where you are based on the movements. That's what an INS does. Nuclear submarines have an INS as well. And also the INS systems on, on, on missiles. But if you have a nuclear weapon system, like a Trident nuke, for example, a nuclear submarine, and it's underwater for a month, when it pops up to surface height, to, or not even surface height, to launch height, which is still below water, the moment that missile pops up above the water, it has no idea where it's gone. INS is useless after a month. Hell, it's useless after a couple of days underwater. So, uh, well, probably not these days. And so, all of a sudden, this was during the Cold War, the US wanted a way to ensure the destruction of Russia if they were the victims of the first strike. So if Russia suddenly, out of the blue, destroyed every nuclear aircraft bomber or the missile silos, how could the US ensure the destruction of the US and its nuclear submarines? And they needed a way for the Trident missiles to know exactly um, where they were. And so they created GPS. GPS is a weapon system that ensures the destruction of the Soviet Union. That is why it's funded. A to, put a to B navigation, just a, ah, oh, yeah, whatever, don't give a shit. <laughs> um, but it did help for troops, because originally GPS navigation was only for military use. Uh, and even back then it was pants, because it was like up to, you know, 50 meters. <laughs> uh, now you can get it, you know, up to, uh, you know, a meter on your phone, or less. And so, yeah, the, the nukes needed to know where it was uh, and to ensure the destruction of Mother Russia. Um, the internet is a weapon system. Physicists originally created the internet to communicate with each other, from Hawaii to the mainland, to talk about physics. Um, and they wanted this World Wide Web. And the, the people, the purse strings, the government said, nah, can't be asked. But then it got the green light. Why did it get the green light? To ensure the survival of the US in the event of a nuclear holocaust. TCP IP, the modern internet structure as we know it, is a nuclear resistant communications grid that ensures C2, so command and control. The US needed command and control capabilities in the event of an all-out nuclear war. The internet was created and funded as a weapons system. Obviously, all of these things I'm talking about right now are defensive. They could be seen as defensive weapon systems, but we'll see. SHA-256, the National Security Agency, the NSA, needed a way to encrypt all of its shizzle. What did it do? It created SHA-256 and then 512, and then, oh God, there's, there's so many different shards right now. But it was a, a weapon system to ensure the, the safety of US command and control lines. It's a weapon system. So when you start looking at things as weapon systems, freaking everything is a weapon system these days, whether you know it or not, or it originated from the, from the forges of war. So what is Bitcoin? When you look at it, Bitcoin is a chain of custody and property rights. It's a store of economic energy. It's data transfer and communications, all of which are nuclear attack resistant. They are using everything. They're using you know, SHA-256, TCP, IP. Bitcoin is a nuclear resistant monetary system that has loads of other spin-offs. And so when this was, again, this was a big slap in the face because all of a sudden a whole bunch of different jigsaws, stuff, stuff which I thought was bullshit and completely irrelevant that I learned in the Air Force, suddenly came front of mind and went, holy shizzle. Um, it's all making sense now. And so I then started to think about what, what is the world? The world, effectively, are, imagine the world as sort of a playing field and each country is a node. Like Elon said earlier about money, you need to look at everything in the, in, in the way of information transfer. So every country out there 
is, is a node, really. And what do countries and civilizations do? They trade with one another. So you need ships to send stuff to and from. But when you have ships and shipping routes and trade routes, what do you need? They're always pirates. So you need a navy. You need a military to ensure the survivability and the safety of your trade routes and, and of your trading partners. So great, we can now send stuff from A to B and we can trade with each other. But what else do you need? You need a form of money to transact with. You need a form of money where your trade actually works. I can't sell you 30 beef, beef cows and then in exchange for you know, 12 chickens or whatever, because you know, there's, there's no longevity. And then we get into the seven principles of money and all that stuff. You've all heard this before. Um, and so you need a, a strong, good, and hard monetary system. But also, what's stopping you sending a big ship of stuff across the, the oceans to your trading partner, and they're going, yoink, thank you. You need the rule of law, and you need the, the rule of law and the enforcement of law. Hence, we have the judicial system and the local police forces. And when the lo like, if you've anyone, anyone's played GTA, when you get enough sirens and stuff, they send in the army. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's basically like that. So the world only operates when you have trade routes, which is protected by a military, normally a navy, historically a navy. You need a strong currency supply, which is uh, recognized by both parties, and you need the rule of law so that contracts are enforced and adhered to. And if that doesn't happen, local police will come and enforce it and local laws. If that doesn't happen, they send in the army. Um, that is what human civilization is. That's why we are different than rats in the utopian experiments or Universe 25 experiments. So, <clears throat> and, and what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is all of them. It's its own military which defends itself. It is its own monetary system, and it has its own rule of law, as in its code. Code is law. And so the army, what is the army that protects the Bitcoin network? Any guesses? Spot on, Mark, and everyone else. The Bitcoin mercenary or military that defends the network are the miners. It is the best. In fact, a lot of people thought, think that the Romans had, you know, very diehard, you know, must die for Italy or Rome. Most of the Roman um, Empire was built by mercenaries. The Roman Empire would pay armies to go and invade someone else. Um, that way, it wouldn't be Italian blood spilt on the battlefields of Gaul, and, and it, would, it would be mercenaries. And, and mercenaries are quite... Oh, I'm going off on a whole other tangent. I'm, I'm not good at tangents. Um, but yeah, the, the mining network is, is a mercenary or military. And it doesn't matter if there are bad actors. If all of a sudden a whole country of miners started mining empty blocks and tried to absolutely sabotage the integrity of Bitcoin, well, all that would happen is that the hash rate would then be picked up with other good miners, and then the, the network would automatically default to the, the, the proper mining. It would be very quickly picked up if a whole bunch of uh, negative blocks were being, were being mined. So it is a self-fulfilling you know, merc yeah, mercenary military that protects itself. Um, and the proof of, <laughs> proof of work is so expensive because it needs to be. How freaking expensive would it be to do a 51% brute force attack on Bitcoin? Hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And even then it would take, you need a good five year run up to even get the resources and allocate, uh, to even set up for a 51% uh, brute force attack. We would see it a mile off. It just can't be done. So it's the world's, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Prophecy is a positive feedback loop, which has been beautifully created. It's the world's most resilient network. It's never been hacked. All of the Bitcoin hacks that you've been hearing about are people being hacked. It's the banks being hacked. It's the wallets. The network has never been hacked. So it is the world's most resilient network. And therefore, it attracts more users. Again, positive flywheel here. And more users means price goes up. That's just a secondary byproduct. I actually, these days, don't give a shit about the price of Bitcoin. Um, I, all I care about is the meaning of what Bitcoin is going to bring to the world. Um, price goes up, which means it continues to reward the mercenary or military, as in the miners, to protect the system. And when you have more miners increasing the hash rate, um, that helps the security of the system. So the, the, the hash rate, as in the amount of work being done to protect and, trans and, and validate blocks on the network, makes it even tougher and even stronger to, to, to hack. And therefore, it then makes it the world's most resilient network. And it goes on and on and on. It's absolutely beautiful. And therefore, 
this is creating a new paradigm shift of eventually, not now, uh, mutually assured preservation. At the moment, we have nukes which we can't lob to each other because it's the end of our species. So it's mutually assured destruction. With this, once everything moves over to a Bitcoin standard, you then become en enemies turn into frenemies. And it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so you're all helping each other. And so I love this quote. I, I still don't know who said it, but it's amazing. And oh, my OCD is kicking in here. I've forgotten, the, I've forgotten this. Stand by. Oh, the world is correct. Phew. Um, <laughs> every day that Bitcoin doesn't go to zero is another day that it will never go to zero. I love that quote, and it's so true. And the thing is, we've, we've all heard of the saying, history is written by the victors. And it sort of is, but there's more to it behind the scenes. Um, when, I, when I was looking into this, my whole part of my brain and suddenly fired up, I, I, I love this topic. So history is written by the victors, okay? And, and, and when you really do look into history, there's huge parts of human history that have just been wiped from existence. Because normally when, especially back in the past, the, the victors tend to des destroy books. And they, destroy, they, they tend to destroy all um, remnants of whatever civilization. Take the Nazis. They just literally burnt everything to the ground that wasn't Nazi-ish. Um, and so what I've found, when you apply this principle to the currency system, as in the world monetary system or the world reserve currency, you'll see that there are certain um, changes of guard. And most world reserve currencies... They, they tend to last about 100 years or so. Um, now, this only goes back to 1,200. Before that, you have roughly 1,000 years of Byzantinian currencies in lots of different forms, okay? So uh, the Byzantines went through, yeah, a, a good 1,000 years of debasing their currency supply over and over again, but it's not that accurate. However, from 1200 onwards, it's pretty damn accurate. So we had the, the Florence, Florent, uh, <coughs> the, the Florentine Florence. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know where to cough because my mic is right here. Um, and then the Venetian Ducat. And they sort of lived in parallel. Uh, but as you can see, there was always sort of a, a 100, 150 year period of, of global reserve currencies. And then we had the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch. The Dutch was a huge empire. A lot of people forget about the Dutch. They had a huge empire. And were it not for the Dutch, we basically launched the British Empire off of what we learned from the Dutch. Um, and then, really, since the end of World War II, it's been the Yank Yanks, Yankees, the, the US, sorry. Um, and we are seeing the beginning of the Bitcoin standard. But I, I actually think Bitcoin is one more removed. Um, I didn't create this chart, by the way. It's from BTCM Research, whoever they are. Uh, I, I just found it on Google Images. Yoink. Um, actually, if I was creating this chart, I'd put Bitcoin one, for one level down and probably from 2050 onwards. In the interim, as, as the last dime gasp of fiat currencies, I believe CBDCs will, be, will sort of transform the way that the, the world reserve currency is. So as you can see with the US dollar, it's already had a whole bunch of different forms of the dollar reserve currency. Um, and the last whimper of this will be some cocktail shenanigan of uh, CBDCs. But eventually, Bitcoin will come into its prime. And so if we go back to the, the Florin and the, the Ducat, sometimes you have competing powers, and which is why sometimes you have dual global reserve currencies, or you may have an official global reserve currency and an unofficial one. A bit like what we were seeing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is already the unofficial global reserve currency. And back in the day, we had the Venetians and the Florentines all operating, not harmoniously, but there was two worldly recognized currencies which dominated the world. And so you, a lot of people think you only get one currency and that's it. Sometimes it's, it's a, an August board of a smorgasbord, sorry, um, stuff. So history, history is written by the victors, but really, if you're trying to apply a first principle way of thinking about it, history is a time partition ledger of the country who could project the most amount of energy. That's actually what it should be. It's a time partition ledger of the country who could project the most energy. Remember the seven stages of civilization? Remember you have the outburst and then the dominance, etc. And whoever won, that, their own currency became the global reserve currency. Um, and you win a war or you, you become the global dominant power because you can project more joules per second. So who, 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 who here is a gamer? Right, 
you all know what DPS is, right? Damage per second. Like when you're playing COD, you don't look at what the, what the fanciest looking weapon, well, if I ever play COD, I look at the, I look at the stats. Which assault rifle dish, dishes out the most damage per second? Then you go with that. Um, it's obvious, really, it's science. Um, <laughs> so <coughs> war is that, it's DPS. Instead of damage per second, it's how many joules of energy can you project per second across the world. Um, war is a joules per second or joules per, yeah, it's a joules per second play. And historically, war has always been about kinetic energy, always kinetic energy. Who could project the most amount of kinetic en energy for, as in the most amount over the longest period of time? Or at least, can you do it more amount of energy, kinetic energy, slightly longer than your, uh, than your peers? Now, the Cold War ended not because of kinetic energy reasons. It was actually economic energy which dealt the killer blow to the Soviet Union. We starved the Soviet Union of oxygen from their economy. That's why they died. We outspent them militarily. We coaxed them into that arms race. And whilst they, they took the, the, the bait and went, right, we're going to have an arms race, we starved them of oxygen so they couldn't keep up. We killed them that way. So war is evolving. It's no longer just kinetic energy stuff. And, and thankfully, we're starting to see an increased use of electrical energy per second. Uh, being. And, and Bitcoin is the ultimate electrical energy per second at war. So yeah, looking at um, global reserves, again, I did not make this slide. I found it in Google Images. Um, I actually know which video this is from. This looks like, in fact, I know this is a, a, a a still taken out of a Ray Dalio video, and someone's superimposed China with Bitcoin. So actually, in his video, it's China. Um, but yeah, this is basically it. Yeah, China's come up, so, so too is Bitcoin. And you'll always see, whenever you see this crossover of a, down, or, of a, a, a collapsing superpower, when you then start seeing sort of the emergence of the next superpower, there's always calamity. Always. There's always war. That's the only thing I can, I can predict confidently. There will be more war. This, this Ukraine thing is not going to fizzle out. Oh, it could fizzle out, but there's going to be something else. Taiwan, that's probably the next thing. Um, so some questions, like, is Bitcoin offensive or defensive? And you've probably heard me say the Shakespeare saying, nothing is good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. It's neither. The road network, is that offensive or defensive? It's both. It's offensive when you're sending you know, a bunch of troops to go and raid some villages, but it's also defensive when you're thinking about supplies coming in. Same with GPS. It's, it's, it could be defensive when you're using it to get from A to B, but when it's guiding a, a, a Polaris or a Trident missile to its target destination, it's offensive. Any weapon system is defensive or defensive. Having a gun in your, uh, you know, a concealed gun, that, that is, you can use it for defensive purposes, but you can also go and do bad things with it. So any weapon is neither offensive or defensive. It depends on what's, <laughs> on who the victim is. It depends on perspective. Are you the victim of this weapon, or are you the, the, uh, the protagonist? So if Sun Tzu was still alive and had a slightly physics mindset, they, he would probably come up with this term. I made this up. Can you project more joules per second over a longer epoch than your enemy? Epoch being a time period. So if I were to punch you in the face, what is this? This is me projecting kinetic energy into your face and displacing mass, i.e. displacing the mass of your head from here to here. That is what a fight is, basically. And then if you got clever and you go, okay, I see your fists, so I'm gonna raise you a stick. Um, well, that's you using physics. You're using now a lever. You're using moments and arms, and you're delivering more kinetic energy in a shorter period of time and maybe for longer. So it's a more efficient way of fighting. And then things get serious. You're like, OK, screw sticks and fists. I'm going to upgrade my game here. And then you end up with weapons, you, you know, bigger sticks, pointier sticks, arrows, guns, bombs, bazookas, whatever it may be. Um, and that's what humans do. We are very good at elevating the game. <laughs> you know, is that, I should put that meme. Well, that escalated. Um, and then we enter. This sort of thing. I mean, this is how crazy humans are. We fired a nuke out of a cannon, out of a freaking howitzer. We fired a small 15 to 18 kiloton warhead from a freaking howitzer. Um, 
And these are some of the effects of a teeny weeny nuke. Teeny weeny nuke. Uh, uh, for scale and reference, Nagasaki and Hiroshima was about 15, 18 kilotons. This little cannon nuke is about the same. But I still find it fascinating. It's horrible. I hope we never ever see them again. But it's absolutely fascinating how the shock waves work and how oxygen is then sucked out as you actually get two waves. Um, sorry, three waves. Anyway, um, I digress. You're here to learn about Bitcoin, not nukes. So what happens is that the animal that projects the most energy controls the flow of information and distribution of resources and property. Now, what, human, so what nature does typically is they, we slowly evolve more types of, um, uh, let's say, tools to project energy. So animals, they'll, they'll develop hardened foreheads to, to butt each other, or antlers or horns, etc. At no point does nature create a, a species-ending weapon. Whereas humans, we're like silly monkeys. That have, we, we now have species-ending weapons, i.e. nukes. Um, so we've, we've taken Mother Nature and sort of absolutely maxima maximized it. But this is why we're, we're the, for the best of our knowledge, we're the dominant species on planet Earth. Um, and so we, as an animal, we control the flow of information, not that animals need inf information from us, but we, d we control the distribution of resources and property because we, we have bigger sticks than animals do, basically. And also, don't forget, cooperation is actually another weapon system. I can't, this, again, getting into this, cooperation is probably the ultimate weapon system. Homo, we, we've had many iterations of bipeds uh, uh, when, when we're looking at sort of homo, um, bipedal animals, us basically. We've had Homo erectus, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens. There's been so many. There's, I think there's been about 13 at least different iterations of humans, so to speak. Homo sapiens, we're nothing special. Neanderthals were much stronger than us. Um, there, there's a lovely imprint, a fossilized imprint of a human uh, barefoot running in sand in, in Australia. And, they, and, and scientists, have, whoa, scientists have calculated that that human running barefoot on sand was running the speed of Usain Bolt, which is just nuts. And so, but how did Homo sapiens beat Neanderthals and other things? Cooperation. We had a, a larger frontal neocortex, which means we could think. We, we had the power of abstract thought, so we created language, so we could communicate. We could corral with each other. Neanderthals are thick as planks, and they... And, I mean, we ha there's another thing called the Dunbar's law, where you know organisms can only really communicate with about 200 or no 200 other sort of people. Um, with with Neanderthals, it was much smaller because they didn't have language; they couldn't cooperate. Whereas we could, we could have establishments of a thousand people or, or ten thousand people, and so that's why we could take down you know woolly mammoths and, and kill out Neanderthals. Um, co cooperation. That's how single-celled organisms emerge into multi-celled organisms, because by chance, some single-celled organisms so somehow latched onto each other and realized they could take up more resources than single-celled organisms. Like, nature is amazing uh, when you look at it from an energy per second perspective. That's really how it does it. And now, when we look at life as it is right now, we, everything in your life is due to proof of work, or another way, another way to put it, proof of war. We are British. In fact, no, we're not British. I mean, I'm standing here being half Thai, half English, but I, I, I consider myself British. The fact that I can stand here and say I am British is due to hundreds of years of war with France and, other, uh, and the Vikings and the Germans and whatnot. It's proof of war. Jonathan is American, and that he can say he is... Are you, are you American? I'm guessing you're from L.A. But yeah, the fact that he's American is due to proof of work slash proof of war because the Yanks went... See ya, Britain, um, and booted us out. Went, screw you, Queenie, we're out. Um, that's proof of war at its, at its existence. Everything in our life is due to proof of war. And so hopefully, over time, we are moving to, instead of a, a kinetic energy per second gameplay, we move into electrical energy per second gameplay, and it shifts over to Bitcoin, uh, and where we all become frenemies. Now, this is a very utopian world where, you know, a bit like Star Trek where there's no currency or whatnot. But I think this is a long way off. It's very easy to get caught up in all this stuff. Uh, but really, I, I can't see this fairy tale 
coming around for at least another 50 to 100 years, unfortunately. Um, I got really enthusiastic about all this when I was doing my research. I thought, oh, war is changing. And then I quickly realized, nope, it's actually going to get a little bit worse. Um, so, yeah, he who projects the most electrical energy wins the war eventually, fingers crossed. But, um, but the thing is, nukes are too expensive now. And they're not expensive in terms of money, as in it, it, it's loss of life. That's why it's too expensive. It, it's, it's the you know, species ending. That's too expensive for us, which is, why, again, another great meme. Um, and so what we need to do is find a stalemate type of uh, weapon system, like deer antlers, you know, something where we can fight and disagree and, 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 and ha establish a pecking order without nuking ourselves into oblivion. So what is that stalemate um, species-ending weapon? Well, again, as I said, Bitcoin, I think, is the solution. But I think war is going to quickly iter um, uh, change. So, for example, I think the next iteration of, um, and it could be a stalemate thing, is drone warfare. So at the moment, it's basically troops go and die, and then eventually a side wins, right? But with drone technology getting exponentially better these days, we could end up in the situation where two countries go to war, but they've both mastered nano swarms and macro swarms. So a macro drone will be, you know, a dr normal drone size, you know, like a DJI, whatever. And a nano drone will be something which you can't see, something which could fly into your eyeball and bury into your head. That, something like that, or fly down your throat and then all of a sudden it's in you. So when two countries can master nano and macro swarms, and when they have a disagreement, hopefully, I think the battlefield will change to, instead of sending troops across the border, it'll be like epic drone fights in the North Sea, or epic drone fights in the Pacific, or, 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 or wherever. And whichever drone army or air force loses, they lose, and go, okay, you got me. Um, so I, I think, I know I'm being quite facetious here, but I think that is the next iteration of war, when, when we have two nations, or three or more, battling out, and we don't have, we have minimal loss of life, it's basically drone loss. Um, but basically, at the moment, the cost of war is blood. All global conflicts are written in the cost of blood when it's better uh, written in hash rate. It, that, that's a far more sensical, logical way of war when, you know, if we all become frenemies and then wars are decided by electrical energy projection, basically. Whoever can project more hash rate wins. And by doing so, it still increases the the efficacy and the, the resilience of this network. And if, just think about it. What would you rather do? What, what form of money would you rather pay a war in? Would you like to pay it in countless millions of deaths or, let's say, a $100 billion electricity bill? Yeah, I'd, I'd much prefer to pay for war in an electricity bill, especially when, give it, a ha you know, not, not, not long, most, nearly all. I reckon within 20 years, all Bitcoin mining will be renewable. And a big chunk of that will be in space. Where's Josh Riddick today? There, well, there's my man. So Josh, I mean, you've been in RT for ages. We, we've been, hey, here's another Age of Empires gamer. Hand up, um, Geek Club. One, two, three, four. Come on, we need to grow these numbers. These are rookie numbers. We need to pump those numbers up. Um, Age of Empires is a, is a game for elite people. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so what is that um, new invention you came up with? You're using f um, farm poo to mine Bitcoin. Elaborate, buddy. Yeah, so uh, it's estimated at the moment that humanity is efficient to um, Legend. Cow poo to crypto. Cow poo to crypto. That's the title of your next book, sir. <laughs> Cow poo to crypto. Um, and by the way, self-published, don't get a publisher. All my books, I make 50p per book sale. And I have to pay full price for my own books. I want more copies of my own book. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, 
So yeah, uh, it won't be long before all crypto mining is in space and completely renewable. In fact, moving forward, when we're looking at tech, I reckon all heavy manufacturing will be in space at some point, and Earth will only be like zoned out for only light production. Light, light production. Um, anyway, so and, ha and and if this happened, it would spark. I mean, it already is sparking one hell of a renewable boom. Um, and so this is my my utopia. I think Bitcoin can save the world and end bloodshed. <laughs> um, and oh, I've already talked about drones, but I just love this scene, so I'm going to play it. This will be the first iteration of drone warfare. This already exists, by the way, this drone delivery system. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's the reason, that's the real reason why Bitcoin needs to be expensive. So that it becomes so expensive, even too expensive to do a 51% brute, brute force attack. It already is there. Um, so yeah, and if it is then too expensive to attack, then everyone will use it for chain of custody and property rights and store of wealth. We're getting there, folks. We are getting there. And it then leads us back to this, this picture I've already shown you, mutually assured preservation, much better than destruction. So, um, so I, what I would like to see over time is this equation being rewritten. And it's happening very slowly, very, very slowly. And unfortunately, Ukraine and all that sort of stuff is just exacerbating this. this. So what war is, so human life plus chemical energy, as in petrol, diesel to move trucks, wall, planes and ships and stuff. Economic energy, money, electrical energy, so there are direct energy weapons out there and other stuff, uh, plus money equals the cost of chain of command, so uh, chain of custody, property rights and rule of law. That is the ultimate, so all of this is the, the cost of having chain of custody, property rights and rule of law. And eventually it's going to be this. You can just boil it down to electrical energy projection. Um, I think it will happen in our lifetime, potentially. But yeah, something to be aware of. So have I lost you all yet? Probably. Um, <laughs> how is this relevant to me? It's probably the thing that's going in your head. Um, pro yeah, to be honest, it's not relevant at all. I just thought it would be quite fun to talk about. So, <laughs> um, And so this is where the energy sort of question comes in. Oh, it's so... It's so expensive. Well, I look at, I like, I mean, there's so many different types of energy expenditure out there and so many different forms. I like using MTOE, so megatons of equivalent, so in terms of barrels of oil. So when you look at, <coughs> um, let's say China, China is the world's biggest consumer of energy with 3,381 uh, megatons of equivalent energy, uh, MTOE, so as in barrels of oil. Um, and then the US, about halfway there, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you think Bitcoin is on this scale? How many MTOEs per year does Bitcoin consume from mining? 17 and a half. These projections, it's cutting off my slides, damn it. Um, yeah, 17 and a half. It's, it's pitiful, it's negligible. Um, it's, it's not as bad as people think. And so, the, yeah, how much is it to invade a country? Tens of billions of dollars per day. How much is it to invade Bitcoin? You can't. You literally cannot. Uh, which is, again, we need to start storing stuff in Bitcoin. And as I said, um, what, yeah, so what is more efficient in terms of a defensive system? 
at the moment, the, the, the whole chain of custody, property rights, and rule of law is backed and maintained by the US empire, basically. What does the US empire consume? The US empire, as we know, it consumes roughly 20% of the world's energy, whereas Bitcoin consumes about 1%, a bit, it's a bit over 1%, actually. So Bitcoin is a far more efficient mechanism to doing all sorts of shizzle, and it does it all, all at, the same, at the same time. Again, even if you're trying to weigh up you know, the monetary system, when you look at the, the dollar payment network, SWIFT, um, Visa, MasterCard, and all the banking system, et cetera, like, again, that is a huge percentage compared to, to Bitcoin. So um, what time is it? One o'clock, 10 minutes late. Are you all hungry yet? I'm hungry. Um, did today help? Uh, so far this morning, has it helped? I, I've had a bit of an intellectual wank talking about all of this sort of stuff, which doesn't really help us all. Um, I found it quite fascinating. I don't know about you. Um, but yeah, it's food for thought, nonetheless. And someone I spoke to, I think it was probably Lewis, he said, uh, um, not my Lewis, another Lewis, um, told me about a Chomsky quote. And he said that everything we do in life is significant. Everything we do in life is significant. But ultimately, it's meaningless. And, and that's a cool distinction. Meaningless and significance is, again, is a relative vector, isn't it? And so, yeah, that's, that's one thing I've, I've really learned over the last couple of weeks is relative vectors. Everything is relative.